welcome to the channel Gehacktes from Hell. We're streaming from the Bierscheune at Alte Hölle in Brandenburg. The coming talk looks at the method of carbon sinking, a way to limit climate change. Hans-Peter Schmidt will tell us how to do this with the help of biochar. We're really happy to have him as a speaker because Hans-Peter is a pioneer in the field of biochar science. And he has worked on the development of its technologies and their application. Following the talk, we have a short Q&A session. From your devices at home, you can send your questions via Twitter to the hashtag RC3Hell or via the IRC chat or the rocket chat at hashtag RC, RC3 minus Gehacktes from Hell. Uh, later, you can also meet Hans-Peter uh, in a Jitsi room um, called Diskussion alte-hölle.de And now over to Hans-Peter. For 15 years now that I work um, on methods to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and to sequester the extracted carbon uh, in a stable form um, either in soil or in sediments. And Uh, we found, and, and many others who, who work on the same subject, found uh, several methods um, that can extract significant amounts of carbon dioxide and also methods that can transform uh, the extracted carbon dioxide into stable carbon forms that do not uh, degrade biologically or chemically. And the Itaka Institute, for which I work, uh, also developed uh, the first carbon sink certificate uh, that can certify um, and assess uh, the amounts of carbon that are stored in carbon sinks. And now at the end of 21, uh, we, we are at the stage that several of these technologies could be scaled and have to be scaled um, to reach the objectives um, of the climate policy. But this scale up of these technologies is so massive that it will have an influence on the um, geophysics of our planet and that we have to consider and those risks we have to think them now without further waiting um, to scale climate technologies but uh, we, we need to take care that um, this scale up is done sustainably and And in, in our talk, uh, I, I want to, to make some of these points that um, we will not hopefully save the climate to get extinguished by other means in the end. So the, the, the situation is rather clear and uh, most in the world, most governments Uh, and people understood it by now that we need to reduce the emissions to close to zero by 2050. Um, and, and in all scenarios, uh, we should have reached already um, the point of highest emissions uh, by now. But in fact, uh, emissions still rise, but um, everybody counts on um, on emission reductions to happen uh, rather soon. So we, to be honest, we cannot see these reductions uh, happening um, in the close future. But let, let's let's assume emissions will be reduced, then. According to the plan, until 2050, 
even then we will need massive carbon sinks because of the effect of the CO2 that was already emitted to the atmosphere and that is not degraded but has a global warming effect that continues for several um, hundreds and thousands and ten thousands of years. So um, to clean up um, legacy emissions we need to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and need to establish carbon sinks and we know that if everything goes according to the plans of the Paris uh, Treaty and, and, and other um, decision makers then we need to extract 800 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere by the year 2100. Um, so this is not to balance further emissions, this is only to balance the effect of the emissions already occurred. But the technologies that are available um, to extract carbon dioxide, they are called the negative emission technologies. It's negative because it positive is when you emit to somewhere and negative would be uh, just a subtraction. Not a nice name, but that's what it is. So net technologies um, are nature-based, like afforestation uh, and the growth of biomass, which in fact is the way to extract naturally carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And as long as this biomass is growing, and does not decompose, um, the carbon is stored. However, when you transform the uh, biomass carbon by pyrolysis uh, into a stable form like biochar and pyrolytic oils, this um, transformed carbon can be stored for longer times and that's what is here in the middle, the biochar or pyrogenic carbon capture and storage method. Um, which is partly nature-based and partly um, persistent and measurable because you have long-term carbon sink that cannot just go away by accident like in a forest fire. There are other means like enhanced weathering. We take volcanic uh, stone powders um, that can react to um, carbonates and then there is direct air capture is when when you extract um, by adsorption uh, the CO2 so you filter air and you extract the CO2 and transform it then into uh, something that you can store so our speciality is PICS the biochar method and um, just shortly to show you um, how this works. Um, so you have biomass, you heat the biomass in the absence of air up to uh, 400 to 800 degrees and then um, it's like cooking without air this biomass and then you have a solid residue which is the biochar, a liquid residue that you can uh, condense from the gas phase which is the pyrolytic oil and you still have a permanent gas which usually is um, combusted to drive the whole process which is um, energy neutral so you do not need external energy to run this process and and then this biochar uh, can be used, for example, in agriculture um, to increase yields um, and to improve soil quality. Um, and then this makes that you have, can grow more biomass that then again can go back uh, to, uh, to the production of uh, biomass and then transforming by pyrolysis. Biochar can also be used uh, in industrial products and in building materials and plastics and, um, and composite materials uh, where the carbon does not decompose neither. So, so this is in very short what is 
PICS, pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. Um, this is a pyrolysis unit of, of a, a smaller size um, that can produce uh, up to something like 1,500 tons of biochar per year. Um, so shortly again how it looks uh, inside a pyrolysis, so biomass that is shredded to smaller particles uh, goes into the screwdriver and um, so it's avoided that any air can enter this process and then it goes into this screw reactor and the biomass uh, is uh, transported here in this reactor where it is heated from environment temperature of 20 degrees up to 600 degrees and then the biochar is the solid residue of this cooking that flows out of the process while the other 50% uh, of the carbon is in the gas phase um, which is separated here and then in this case all the gases are burned to produce thermic energy that drives the process and is then be used um, for heating purposes. However, uh, if you do not burn the gases, uh, you can also condense the gases and use the liquid um, of, of the process. So the biochar is, looks uh, like this. Uh, it's a very porous material um, that conserves um, the biological structure. Here you have a piece of wood that is carbonized. It looks like charcoal. Uh, and if you look on uh, the microscope, you see uh, this enormous porous structure, which explains a lot of functions and effects that we see in biochar. So for example, you can um, impregnate it uh, with organic fertilizers. Um, and then all these pores are filled with organic fertilizers, is preserved so it cannot be leached out to the soil and plants and microbes can feed uh, from these conserved organic uh, fertilizers. Uh, so we have an effect of this biochar on economic systems, but what I want to talk about today is only the effect that if you put this biochar to soil, this carbon, which was CO2 in the atmosphere, which was assimilated by the biomass, which was transformed um, in the pyrolysis to aromatic carbon, which is this black stuff. This aromatic carbon cannot be degraded uh, over centuries by microorganisms. So if you put it to soil, it is a long-term carbon sink. So, to have a global effect, um, we need a lot of biomass. Um, in the European context, uh, we could say yeah, we use um, residual biomass leftovers from food processing or harvest residues or manure uh, or cereal sludge. So these are all biomass that could be uh, transformed by pyrolysis. However, uh, the amount um, of this residue carbon is not um, as much as it could have a climate effect. We need a lot more biomass. And it means we have to grow biomass, especially for the extraction of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the transformation by pyrolysis. So we have to combine carbon farming systems with PICS, with pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. And there are different methods that are not just monocultures, um, highly intensive um, production, but these are what we call carbon farming systems um, like you can see here, these are silver arable, so you combine wood um, so, and shrubs uh, with arable with crops. Um, or you have uh, this kind of agroforestry systems that are highly productive in regard to biomass. 
uh, instead of having just pastures, you can have silvo pastures, uh, so animals range uh, below trees that produce uh, additional biomass. Uh, we would also need uh, algae farms that are highly productive and could be combined to shellfish and algae would um, um, also clean uh, coastal water from uh, exceeding nutrients. And so we can see that if we investigate uh, different farming systems um, that in addition to food production, because we do not want to replace food production by biomass production, but in addition to the food production, which is the green bar in a tropical uh, agroforestry system, uh, we can produce the same amount of food as now, but in addition, um, we can produce biomass for carbon sequestration. Also in systems like tropical forest garden, you can have both and you can intensify the systems. Um, however, the uh, suggested eucalyptus monoculture, as you can see here, is, would only be for carbon capture and would not produce food. And as you can see, it's not very efficient anyway. Um, it just doesn't make much work. Um, and also marine seaweed is quite efficient in this regard. Now, um, if we come back, if we want now this part, this green part, this is the carbon sink part that we need to balance uh, global temperatures. Uh, and we know we need uh, 270 billion tons of carbon in this carbon sink. So this is 800 uh, gigaton CO2 equivalent. And what does it mean if we would, with this method, pyrogenic carbon capture and storage, deliver 30% of the necessary carbon sink? What does it mean for global resources? So for this to happen, for this 30% of the minimum necessary carbon sink, we would need about 100 billion tons of biochar, 100 gigatons of biochar until 2100. And just to get an imagination on how much this is, this is the amount of 1,500 of these Matterhorn uh, mountains. So the volume of one Matterhorn that you find in the Swiss Alps multiplied by 1,500 with dense biochar. So just the imagination of how much we need to extract and sink, and that's only 30%. And this amount corresponds to a thin layer of two centimeter of biochar. So two centimeter of biochar on each hectare of global agricultural land. So we would have to cover all agricultural land by two centimeters of biochar which then will be dicked uh, or plowed into the soil as a carbon sink. So this is massive, massive, massive. And it only makes 30% of the biochar. So we would need to uh, produce this amount of biochar. We would need 190 gigatons of biomass. And so this 100, 190 gigaton of biomass um, we need to compare to the global standing biomass and that's about 0.8% of the global standing biomass. And 0.8% of the global standing biomass would have to be pyrolyzed every year from the year 2050 to 2100 to uh, produce the amount of carbon sink that's necessary to preserve 30% of the climate. And that would need about 380,000 industrial pyrolysis plants. So we calculated and looked on um, what does it mean to uh, produce 400,000 um, pyrolysis, industrial pyrolysis plants. 
we imagine that it could be or it has to be produced in chain production like cars. Uh, but to reach uh, the um, negative emission potential that's necessary by 2050, we need an exponential growth of the production of these pyrolysis units, which would be possible. And you, you, see, you see here, um, this is uh, the blue line. Uh, so we have this exponential growth. Um, and, and as you can see, we have then a slowdown um, of, of the uh, growth of absolute numbers. So the, the orange line here, you see the production numbers per year. So you, you have to go until 2043 to produce 50,000 units per year. But then you have to, to slow down uh, the production because we can only use 400,000 pyrolysis units on Earth. After that, we do not have uh, more biomass to treat. So we need an exponential growth because of the severity of the, pro of the problem. And then we need an exponential degrowth um, after 2043 um, to a steady state um, of the production of few plants uh, that are needed to renew uh, the standing plants. So this is very interesting from an economic point of view. And we will see this in several areas because of the global economy and the global problems and the uh, global limits of resources that we need um, exponential growth and degrowth for several technologies and how, how that will be done that's that's very interesting that's the subject of today um, so so you saw it's massive what would be needed um, 400,000 plants um, and one plant costs about 1.3 million euro. So that's about 500 billion euro. And that is not so much in the end. It's less than 50% of the annual military spending. So from an economic point of view, it would certainly be possible to make it happen. So more problematic is how can we um, make it happen on an economic point of view? Uh, financially, this is very attractive. As we can see, first the production of the industrial units, and then you have a global carbon sink market. Um, if you calculate 100 euro per ton of CO2 equivalent, and we know how much uh, CO2 we need to extract, so this is a 400 billion euro market per year only for carbon sink credits. So massive and very interested market and that's why you see a lot of financial institutes going already now to these markets well what do we have with the risks and side effects so um, the 0.8 percent of the global plant mass that has to be paralyzed every year that's about um, 0.75 ton biomass per hectare of agricultural land. So if we extract from every hectare of the world's uh, crop land um, a bit less than one ton of biomass, we could solve the problem. So that does not seem too much. However, uh, this biomass is everywhere. And there are, there are millions of farmers that all would have to be convinced to do it. And then we have to bring the uh, industry close to them so that they can extract the biomass. So let's say if 10% of agricultural land was used for biomass production by carbon farming. Uh, so we set aside 10% of the uh, global agricultural land. And then we only need 7.5 tons of biomass uh, per hectare um, and that would be feasible because thanks to biochar based fertilization crop productivity can increase um, for about more than 20 percent so to have 10 percent aside would be possible so let's say um, it would in theory be possible to produce the biomass necessary for the carbon sinks on the available agricultural land without 
um, decreasing food production. But in the last five minutes uh, of my talk, I want to give you another outlook um, because socially and environmentally, uh, it's still very much on the edge uh, to do this huge scaling carbon, pyrogenic carbon uh, storage project. Because we have several other problems on Earth, not only the climate problem, we have the biodiversity crisis, uh, other ecosystem crisis, and therefore um, the Half Earth project was um, lanced um, about five years ago uh, to say that um, it is needed that 50% of the Earth's surface is preserved for nature recovery. Um, and there are in fact quite a lot of governments that uh, agreed to this program, astonishingly, um, and it has a lot of um, support, this initiative from O.G. Wilson. Um, you find more information on Half Earth Project um, on the website that you see here below, because that's that's the, the point. If we do all this climate action, we do not have enough land to preserve it for natural revival. Um, however, we have technology that's possible. And in the latest uh, Saudi Arabian uh, solar energy project, um, the kilowatt hour was produced at 0.8. 88 cents and that means energy becomes so cheap that we have new um, possibilities for technology um, to produce in fact um, carbon sinks without plants so the Obrist company um, they created this project a fuel which is a methanol factory that runs entirely on renewable powered energy. So you have these large solar panels, and then you have uh, here the, um, the chemistry that's behind. So in short, uh, you have direct air capture here where you filter out the CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, the energy is used for electrolysis um, that is done with desalinated water so they produce hydrogen from desalinated water with the solar energy um, and with the co2 from direct air capture there is methanol synthesized and methanol um, is a liquid form of carbon it's a bit like alcohol but just methanol and uh, which is not toxic which can be pumped, which can be transported, which can be used as a fuel, and which could also be used as a carbon sink. So you, you can find here, and when you have more time, you, you can go into details. Um, so we calculated um, the, the total balance. So for 500,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in the carbon sink, so that means we extract 500,000 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere, we need 11.5 uh, square kilometers of solar panels that produce uh, 6,000 gigawatt hour of energy. Part of this energy is used for the direct air capture. Part of this energy is used for desalination and electrolysis, which produces uh, oxygen. And then the hydrogen and the CO2 are synthesized to methanol where you produce some energy that goes back to the process, where you produce also water that also goes back to the process, and then you have a carbon sink. And this methanol, in fact, um, can be pumped back into old fossil uh, storages, like in the Saudi Arabian desert. And so we scale this up and we would need only 21% of the surface of Saudi Arabia used for this methanol carbon sink technology 
to sequester the necessary 800 gigaton of CO2 equivalent and pump it back into abandoned fossil oil fields until 2100. Um, and the interesting thing is that only this is only 10% of the surface that would be needed uh, if we do the same thing with plants and biomass and where everything works perfectly, optimized, uh, without chemical fertilizer, without irrigation, and not counting the risk of fire and other disasters happening to the biomass production. So with this technological solution, I think we could prepare the biggest, the biggest hack ever to turn the Arabian fossil fuel producers into carbon sink producers and pump back the liquefied carbon extracted from the atmosphere to the fossil oil fields. Thank you very much. Um, so, how can we avoid the risk of deployment of CO2 sinks becoming a cheap excuse for not pursuing the necessary reduction of CO2 emissions? On the other hand, yeah, this is this is the main the main problem I think now when we enter this carbon sink markets, because uh, all the carbon sinks that are bought now are used for emission compensation and um but but we have no choice we have to curb the emissions so normally policy uh, makers should uh, defend the compensation of emissions with carbon sinks because the carbon sinks we need for the compensation of legacy emissions of all this year two that was already emitted uh, before now Mm, yes. Um, so, how do you estimate the potential of pigs against the background of increasing interest in biomass for food, energy, and chemical industry? Yeah, we 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 need all of it, and we will not have enough of it, and that's why I presented the possibility to uh, extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for the chemical industry, for fuel, for materials, for plastics, and also for carbon sinks. I think we will not achieve uh, the protection of our ecosystems and of the climate uh, with the biomass that we have on the planet only. All right. Actually, just a fourth question came in. I'm, I'm, I think we have time for one more little question. How can we be sure that Oprist would be more successful than, in example, Desertec? And what was the first one? How can we be sure that uh, Oprist Op yeah. would be more successful than Desertec? Yeah, I... The economics are much better now because uh, solar energy is so much cheaper than 20 years ago when Desertec started. Um, and the, the system is more complex because of the coupling uh, with chemical industry, with carbon sink, and the necessity is also higher. So I, I think uh, we, we can achieve this and, and Desertec uh, is not dead yet. Um, and, and could continue also towards uh, more complex systems. All right, thank you. Well, hans Peter, thank you very much. Um, I'm saying goodbye to you in the stream now, but everyone is invited to join further discussion in the Jitsi room now, which you can reach under uh, diskussion.alte-hölle.de. Goodbye from Bierscheune and see you in the Jitsi room. Thank you.